Hallelujah. Glory to God forever. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. He died, but he rose again from the dead. He is seated in majesty on the right hand side of the Father. He's our Savior, our Redeemer, our King. Mm. There's no like Him. Jesus is Lord. He paid the price for our redemption. He redeemed us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us to the kingdom of his, of, of his own kingdom. That is exactly what he did. By his blood, the blood he shed transferred us from the old kingdom of darkness, pulled us out of our family lineage, redeemed us from every family by his blood, every kindred, every tongue, so we don't participate in the evil affiliated with the tribe we came from. Revelation 5, verse 9 and 10. Jesus redeemed us from our family, from the tribe we came from, from our past. He redeemed us. To be redeemed means paid for and brought up from. Paid for and brought up from. So he paid for you and brought you up from where you used to be. So you are redeemed from every family. So the complications and the evil in your occurrences associated with your family, your biological family, have no right, no legality to repeat or reoccur in your life. Why? You are redeemed. The word redeemed means paid for and brought up from. So you don't share out of the evil occurrences of your family, your biological family, of your village, of your town, of your country, because you are redeemed from there. You have no reason to suffer what they suffer. You have no reason to experience the evil they experience. You don't have a reason to pass through what they pass through. Because you are redeemed. And made a priest and a king to reign on earth. I dedicate everyone who is listening to me. Every spirit of contradiction to your redemption is caged today and banished out of your life in the name of Jesus. You are redeemed. There's been no redemption. There's been no salvation. It is our understanding of this that we go out to communicate to people, to bring them to the kingdom of redemption, that they may experience redemption. That's why we preach the gospel of salvation. That they will come and participate in the benefit of redemption. But you must know it. You must know it that that is the meaning of Christianity. You are redeemed from your past. That the past do not affect your today. Many people are still grieving over their past. That is because of what happened in the past. Is because of, no, no, no. What is the meaning of salvation? That's the benefit we enjoy in being called to come and be a child of God. Where your past will not affect your now. Said so if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Oh God. <laughs> I declare in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth over that man, that woman that is listening to this broadcast. Every spirit that is trying to enforce the old evil experiences into your today, that spirit is bound in the name of Jesus 
I send up that devil out of your life in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I declare the hold is broken from your life in the name of Jesus. If any man be in Christ is a new creature, all things are passed away. That's the meaning of salvation. That the experiences you used to experience as a non-believer, you don't have to experience those evil experiences again. No, you don't have to. When you see it, it's an invitation for a contention against this contradiction of your redemption. You know, I told you before that the contradictions you see in your life that is contrary to the message of salvation you had that brought you into redemption. If you experience contradiction, it's not explaining the powerlessness of the gospel. No. It's not explaining the neglect of God that God neglected you. No. 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 It's not explaining the, the absence of power in God to help you. No. It's not explaining the power of the devil that the devil is very powerful. That's why we're expressing all this. No. Every contradiction has one purpose. It's an invitation. You are invited to prove that you believe redemption. You are invited to prove it by fighting. He said, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight of faith. Faith. What you believe. Now you see a contradiction. Fight it. How? It's first of all to know that this thing is a lie. You know the truth. What you are passing through is a lie. It's a wrong manifestation. You are welcome to 2023 online prayer and worship conference. Day number four. Day four. Day four. When you experience a contradiction, you are invited. It's God allowing you, inviting you to prove that you believe redemption. That this experience is not supposed to be. So fight it out. It's not about me. not about the devil. It's about you proving it. And this prayer conference and worship conference, let me quickly explain to you how you, how you fight the contradiction. Is to know the truth as against the contradiction. Know the truth. Like the, what I declared, just, just, just two references like I declared just now. One, any man being Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away. You cannot be in the new kingdom and be experiencing the negativities of the past. And be experiencing the, the negativities, the evil you were experiencing as an unbeliever. He see happening in your life as a Christian. He is not supposed to be. When you have such experiences, it calls you to exercise your muscle. To exercise your authority. To exercise the power God gave you when, he, when you got born again. Don't let it scare you. Don't be, be disturbed. Don't be don't freak out. Don't be don't be fidgeting. Don't be say oh don't don't panic. Is is for practice to prove that redemption is valid. So the first step you take is to thank God for the glorious gospel, mm -hmm. for the benefit of redemption. You thank Him. And thanking him means you believe. Then the second thing you do is to take authority against the spirit behind that contradiction. I told you before, for every contradiction, there is a spirit. Every contradiction to your redemption 
has a spirit involved. You bind that spirit and cast that devil out of your experience. You know you have the power. <laughs> you have to know what you have. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devil. They shall cast out devil. In my name they shall cast out devil. Demons. So you have the power. So you bind and cast away the devil of contradiction. Then the next thing you do is to stop the, the signs and the symptom of the contradiction. Every sign and symptom trying to make it look as if the scripture is a lie. After I'm born again, I'll still be experiencing the ugliness of my lifestyle when I wasn't born again. No, I stop you. Militantly, you stop it. The next thing you do is to prophesy. Declare the word. The word of God has power when you say it. That's what God proved in Ezekiel 37 by calling prophet Ezekiel. Say, as bad as this dry bone situation is, there's a way to change the situation. Even though it looks hopeless, is by saying what I said. That's all. That's all. Look for what I said about this situation. And you keep on saying it. That's all. And Ezekiel kept on saying what God said about the bone. Bone gather. When God said it, he didn't gather because God rules in heaven. It's you that rules on earth. You are the one that will say it for any problem on earth to respond. God has already spoken. His own have happened in the realm of the spirit. The two worlds, heaven and earth. Let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you must enforce it. For you are the one that have charge over the earth. He gave the earth to man. The heaven belonged unto the Lord. But the earth he has given to the sons of men. We are the one that rules here. If things are bad, it's because there is no competent man to put it in order. If things are not good, it means there is no competent man to make it good. Any error you see on earth is not a fault of God. It is the absence of the right man. Any error you see on earth is not a fault of God. It is the absence of the right man. That's why God said, I seek for a man. Who will stand between me and the people that they will not experience destruction? I'm looking for somebody. God is looking for somebody. I pray that you will be the one that will say, Lord, here am I. I want to stand for you. That's why God said we are witnesses. A witness is an individual who practically demonstrates the validity of the claim of another. A witness is somebody who demonstrate, who prove the claim of another by practical evidence. That's a witness. That's why you are given the Holy Spirit to be able to prove redemption. That what God said he did in Christ for you is true. And you've got to be militant and bold about that. And Ezekiel kept on declaring the word of God with regards to this situation. And that's how the bone gathered. That's how the sinew came upon them. Flesh came. And they, they were just there. And the Lord says, speak life. Bread. And he also spoke. Bread came and they got up and they became living beings and soldiers. So that's what you do. To change any situation, that's what you do. So, if you have a contradiction, I'll keep on re repeating this pattern of warfare. 
enforcing compliance to your redemption. I'll keep hopefully repeat as frequently as the Holy Ghost will bring it to my spirit. Don't forget, whenever there's a contradiction, whenever there's a contradiction to your redemption, to your expectation, to the gospel that Christ preached, what to do primarily is to look for the word that God spoke from the Bible. Look for a documented word from God. Jesus defeated the devil with the word from the Bible. It is written. It is written. So look for a word that God has spoken about the situation. When you find it, the second thing you do, you give thanks to God for the word you found. Not for the car, not for the house, not for the marriage, not for the baby. No, for the word you saw. For the word you saw. You thank him for that word to show to God that you believe the word you saw. The third thing you do is to know that the contradiction to this word you saw, which you are passing through, is the activity of an evil spirit. And for you to bind that evil spirit and cast him out of the situation. Number four is to stop the contradiction manifestation. Number five is to keep on declaring the promise you saw. Keep on saying it until there's a seeable change and the manifestation of your expectation. Glory to God. That's warfare from a New Testament platform. We don't fight for victory. No, we have the victory in Christ. We fight from the platform of victory. We fight knowing that we have won. We are not trying to win. No, we won in Christ. That's why we are not conquerors. We are more than conquerors. We fight to prove that we are won. We, pride, we fight to prove that we are victorious already in Christ. We fight to prove our victory. We are not fighting to win. No, we won. The devil is defeated. All our prayer must be from that mindset. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Do this a prayer and worship conference. Now, coming back to the worship platform, I want you to understand that prayer begins with worship and ends with worship. Prayer begins with worship and ends with worship. Uh, Jesus was told to explain or teach prayers in the book of Matthew. And he said, when you pray, pray in this manner, which means it's a pattern. It's not to be memorized and recited. That is not prayer. It's just a structure. For reflection. It's a pattern. He said, Our Father. So you see, when you want to go into prayer, you must know that you must worship God as Father. Very key. So your worship recognizes the fatherhood of God. And a father is from a word pata, which means the source and the sustainer. You must see God as the source. All things come from him. He's not only sovereign, he's not only supreme. Everything comes from him. Three qualities of God. One, sovereign. It means he doesn't need assistance to do what he wants to do. He is self-sufficient on his own. And he can overrule. He can bypass protocol that his intention and purposes may be fulfilled. A sovereignty of God.
second qualification of God is supreme. It means there is no other power beyond him. There is no other force beyond him. That's like how many in the judiciary have a supreme court. Supreme court. It means the highest, the apex court. <laughs> he is supreme. Number three, he is the source and the sustainer. You must see, only God, everything that exists today came from him. Everything that exists came from him. And God, the fourth qualification of God is that he is not made. He is self-existing. Exists by himself. Not created, not molded, not made. No, he exists by himself. He is the I am. Put it in your spirit. Four distinguished qualities of a God. So whatever do not have this definition, you don't worship it. It's fake. God, one, is sovereign. Which means it does not need to depend on factors to do what it wants to do. He can break protocol to perform his agenda. But two is supreme, higher than the highest, stronger than the strongest, wiser than the wisest. Number three, he is the source of everything. All things came from him. Colossians 1 16. All things were made by him. For without him was not anything made that was made. Thrones, dominion, power. Principality, we all made by him and for him. He is the source of all creation. And finally, he is not created. He exists by himself. That is God. So you must allow this picture to be in your mind when you are worshipping him. That's why I call him Father. The Father of God has this definition. When he said, Our Father, that is what he was saying. That word Father carries this full definition. So it is in your place of prayer, you must recognize God as Father. You must let this full definition of who God is flow through your mind when you are talking to God. Oh, this conference will change you. I promise you. This conference will redefine your worship and even your prayer life. Please, I beg you in the name of the Lord, share this broadcast. Someone is waiting for you to share this broadcast. That they might be in alignment with this conference. You can phone somebody. Just one hour. Every morning. So when Jesus was teaching lost prayer, he was trying to communicate to you that when you want to begin to pray, there are four things that must Ring bell in your mind. One, the sovereignty of this man you are talking to. He's sovereign. He can operate without anybody being of assistance. He can break protocol just to ensure his purposes to be fulfilled. That's the man you are talking to. Hmm. Our Father who is in heaven. It means he is the person who is supreme. It means there is no other power beyond him. He is the supreme court. This is the guy you are talking to. So when you enter prayer, this must flood your mind. Otherwise you can't worship God where? Our Father 
It means he's the source. Everything I am comes from you. My bed, my eye, my head, my oh, okay. You are my creator. Everything existing today, the moon, the star, all came from you. You are the source of existence. Hmm. That's the one I'm standing to talk with. That's why I'm meditating on this fatherhood of God. Impossibilities are disappearing. Unbelief is flying away. Doubt is disappearing. When you comprehend the supernaturality of the God that you are privileged to talk with. Whew, I feel God. I feel God this morning. I feel God. I'm sure somebody's life is changing. Hmm. So when you come to God and say, Father, you are talking about a God who is, who is sovereign. Who does not need to take permission from any anyone to perform, to help you. No, he doesn't need to seek excuse from someone to, to be able to help you. No, he's sovereign. Number two, he's supreme. There is no other power beyond his power. There is no other ability beyond his ability. He's supreme. Number three, he's the so Nothing that exists, that existed without him. He betted everything. Human beings are only combining things together, joining things. But he, oh, everything they are joining together to make a garment for you is the one that made up. Everything you are seeing today have been in existence in the Garden of Eden. Have been there in the Garden of Eden. It's just that it's now we are discovering it. The capacity of our mind has developed to an extent that we are able to frame out how to bring it out. It has been there from the creation. He created all these things. He is not newly creating them. No. The handset we are holding now, it has been the garden of just that the capacity of Adam has not developed to a dimension he could decode how to make telephone. It has been there. That's why meditation is very vital. It has God have not God God is not recreating. No, He's not He's not creating again. He's not creating the world again. No, He finished creation and He's resting. The work of creation ended. He is now resting. He's not recreating again. No. He is the source of all creations. Hmm. And finally, he exists by himself. Ooh. So begin your prayer from the platform of this. And knowing that this person who has these four qualifications is your daddy. <laughs> is your father. That's what Jesus came to do for you and I. To bring you into the fatherhood of God. That's why Jesus in his prayer in John 17. He said. I have revealed your name to them. I have made them to know your name. I have revealed your name to my disciples. Now. What name did he reveal? Throughout the teaching of Jesus. Jesus. Mention the name of God that he told the disciples. Only one. What is that? Father. Father. My father. I am my father. My father who sent me. My father. Only one. He just made them to know that this God is your daddy. <laughs> oh, glory to God. When this God is awesome being, Self-existing, supreme, sovereign, and the source of all existence is your father. You, you can't be disadvantaged. You can't be disadvantaged. You cannot be disadvantaged. You cannot be disadvantaged. So you've got to know 
that this God is your father. That's why Jesus said, when you want to begin prayer, begin by a thorough understanding of the God you are talking about. That he has a personal relationship, a biological relationship with you. He is your daddy. He is your father. Oh my God. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. May God give you a revelative understanding of the fatherhood of God over you in the name of Jesus. When you have this revelation, you don't worry again. Worry disappear. Unbelief disappear. It's your father. Meditate on these four definitions of God. Who is your father? That this definition of God is your daddy. You cannot have this definition of God as your father and be deficient and be sorrowful. Your understanding this is what changes your life and your situation. You know the prodigal son he suffered in a strange land. He lost everything. He was begging to eat. Eating with animals. His point of recovery was understanding the fatherhood that he came from. He suddenly remembered that his father is a how? Kai! My father has so much to offer and to distribute and to share even the servants in his house they have enough ah! and me i'm suffering a street now he said god i will return back to my when he got a complete comprehensive understanding of the fatherhood that he came from under whom he is his eyes open he queried this the contradiction he queried the situation. He queried why he was passing through what he was passing through. He queried the, the, the circumstance he was in. Oh my God. I pray that somebody will be provoked this morning to query the abnormality you are passing through. To query the situation you are passing through. To query the contradictions around your life. Your father, cool satire. Immediately he realized and remembered the father that betted him. What? He said, I will return back to my father. If I have offended him, I will apologize. And he did. And he didn't need to do anything. The father gave me a ring. <laughs> Oh, my father, you are too blessed to be in this conference. You are too blessed to be in this conference. He just realized the father, the weight of the father. I said, this means what is missing is my relationship with him. It's my fellowship with him. I will go to him. I go to him and stay with him. I confess my sins. And he did. And things changed. The fatherhood of God. Then he went further. Our Father, when you want to pray, pray in this manner. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, many people, they use this when they interact with me. And they are sick. When they, when they make statement of, Daddy, I cannot have a, a father like you. 
anointed to save the sick, anointed to heal all manner of disease, and yet I'm sick. That statement will provoke me. Say, well, that's true. I'll command that devil to leave. He just realized my capacity. He just respected my status. He just realized. And the story of one man of God in scripture who doing excellently well, saints and wonders, ministering powerfully, but the wife was having problems. Which was not resolved. And one day in the church, the glory of God was so strong. And suddenly the, the wife got up from the seat. The man of God said the wife walked away. People were wondering, ah, Mama, Mama, what happened? Mama, what happened? She went back home. Some people were suggesting maybe there's a problem with them. What did Papa say? She went back home to wait for the husband. And as the husband walked in, she knelt down. I said, Pastor, I have been relating with you as husband. But now, I want to see you as my pastor. Man of God, pray for me. The way you minister to others. I need to be, I need to be blessed. I need to be changed. I need to be healed. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a client now. I came for counseling and ministration. You are my pastor. And the husband nearly shed tears. He said, this is the missing link. Husband do not have anointing to redeem you. Husband cannot change your status. It's only a man of God. Your pastor. Until you realize that. Women as pastor's wife, you will suffer under an anointed husband. That is truth. And that's what changed the woman. So you got to know that this God you are talking to, look at his capacity. And then the prodigal son came to that awareness of the father. And that was what brought faith in him. That the situation is redeemable. And the father showed up. <laughs> Our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That word hallowed means respected. Your name is highly respected. I honor your name. I respect your name. I understand your name. I believe your name. That you are the source. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be your name. I honor. I sacredly adore you as supreme. I adore you as sovereign. I adore you as the source of all that I am and all that will ever be and all that exists. I adore you as the one who exists by himself. I adore you as the one with whom nothing is impossible. Hallowed be thy name. Hmm. So you must be meditatively honoring the name that you call. You must meditatively consider that name in respect, in honor, in adoration. You don't just parrot the names of God. No. 
you meditatively consider those names. You can see how I've explained Father this morning. He's bringing more meaning and revelation to you now. So you know many times we have, we have recited the Lord's Prayer. Our Father was in heaven and the kingdom of God. Now we don't have. It has no meaning. It's your meditation on the meaning of Father. The name of God is powerful. He provokes. He is provoked when you call him names. In the book of Psalm 106, verse 8, he said he saved them. Even though they were nasty, they offended him by the Red Sea. Verse 7. He said, nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. So when you call the name of God, when you call the name of God, his power in that direction is evoked. Is evoked for expression. So when you are in worship, meditatively consider names of God. The God that maketh war to cease. Ah. Psalm 46 verse 9. The God that maketh war to cease. My mind goes through all the battles in the Bible of how he made the battles to cease. The war in the life of some people that we thought would never end. How he ended it. The God that maketh war to cease. Hmm. You don't just rush it. You meditate on the name. That's how you hallow it. That's how you honor the name. That's how you glorify the name of God. You say he saved them for his name's sake. Because they called his name. These are Old Testament people. Not just the name of Jesus. Because the name of Jesus have not emerged. So which name were they calling? Circumstantial names. Descriptive names. In the book of First Samuel 7, verse 7 to 10, you can see how Samuel called upon God when the Philistines were coming to attack them and suddenly the Lord thundered, discomfited the Philistines and he placed a mark there and he said, this is the God, my Ebenezer. The God that has helped me previously and that has helped me again, Ebenezer, my helper. So, circumstantial name, the God that maketh war to cease. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 9, look at it. Kelebos Kata. So, calling the names of God. Say, I an integral part of worship which you must engage in meditatively. Verse 9. No. Chapter 1, verse 9. Say, What do you imagine against the Lord or about God? What's your imagination? What's your opinion about God? What do you think of this God? From your mind, what can you conceptualize about this word, God? Look, so let me suggest to you, he will make an altar end. The God that makes an altar end. When you call God this name, then that problem is about to come to an end. Because remember 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, I will not deny myself. If you can find out the name I bear, I will demonstrate it because to let you know that is my name. I will not deny myself. So if you can locate my name, I will prove my name. That's what that's the meaning of that scripture. In my faithfulness, I will prove my name. Have you found my name? <laughs> 
So what do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an altar end. He is the God that makes an altar end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. He will stop the evil and the evil will never reoccur again. Now this scripture I used to pray for people who say, Pastor, uh, I had different for, uh, it went away, it came back, I said, hold on. I know, I know God. I know God enough. I know God enough. And I, I will call this name and minister. That's the end. The woman came and from her Agbo had five, about five miscarriages. No baby yet. I remember this scripture. I said, come all the way from Agbo. Delta State. She came down to Benin when I was in Benin. I said, God is a God that makes an altar end. And the evil will not be your call again. I use this scripture. But the testimony is on the archive. Miscarriage ended and she gave birth to Nancy baby boy. And they brought the boy for testimony. When you know the name of God, there's power. That's what the book of Psalm 75, verse 1 said. He said, wherever wonders are seen, it's because your name is near. Amplified Bible. In the Amplified Bible, Psalm 75, verse 1, Amplified Bible. He said, whenever your wondrous work appear, whenever miracles appear, whenever wonders appear, it's just because your name is near. Somebody called your name. Somebody mentioned your name. Remember this Old Testament? The name of Jesus has not surfaced. So the descriptive name you have for every situation is the invitation for God's performance. The descriptive name of God you have for every situation is the invitation for God to perform. He will demonstrate that name. Because he said, I will not deny myself. He said, call upon me in the days of trouble. And I will surely manifest. Calling the names of God meditatively. is secret. is secret to God's performances. Look at this. In the book of Malachi chapter 3 verse 16 to 18 he said a book of remembrance will be written for them that meditate upon his name a book of remembrance will be written on behalf of those who meditate on his name not those who just call his name no who meditate on his name for every name you call you ponder on that name and see the meaning of that name that you may be provoked to worship him. That's how you all know that name. A book of remembrance will be written for them that meditate upon the name of God. He said, their portion shall always be reserved. What is due you, no one will take away. Your portion will be kept for you, reserved for you, to be delivered to you. Second benefit in that scripture. Said they shall be my personal possession. They shall be mine, God said. Those who meditate on my name. Those who think about my name. They shall be mine. I will personally have them as my possession. Then one, 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 one God said, touch not mine. Anointed. When you are God's own, you don't, no one touches it. Those who meditate on the names of God, they become God's personal possession. With special access to the angelic host of God. In that same scripture, the Lord of hosts will become your God. It means you have access to angelic assistance. Another benefit, when you meditate on the name of God, he said there will be a difference between you who meditate on the name of God and those who don't. Malachi 3, 
verse 16 to 18. In Daniel 11, verse 32, it's a day that no God shall be strong and they shall do exploit. Your strength comes from the name of God you know. You have been able to do exploit come from the names of God you know. Begin to catalog the names of God. Get a notebook. Every name of God that alights in your mind, document it down. When you are in a place of worship, you begin to read them one by one, meditate on it, read another one, meditate on it, and then give God worship. Read another one, meditate on it, and give God worship. That's how you do exploit. Now many people have heard testimonies from the YouTube and Facebook of how I commanded spare part of people to be replaced and their spare part was replaced, their heart changed, their kidney changed, their liver changed, and some part of their body that was damaged, how it was replaced. It is my knowing who he is. I have been ministry healing for many years, but I didn't get to the dimension of body part replacement. Until I got a name of God, and I began to do exploit in that area. What name? The maker. I saw it in Isaiah 54. And also Genesis 1. Let us make man. And my meditating on God sent as the maker. That God is your maker. As I was meditating on God being my maker. Two philosophical statements came into my spirit. Makers can always repair their product when it is bad. So God can repair my body. Number two, makers can replace any damaged part of the body. If it is too damaged, it can be replaced. Ah! It caught my attention. And I began to meditate on God as the maker. The maker of any product can repair the product. And if any part is too damaged, you can replace the. That's why they have spare part. The producer of any product must produce along with it spare part. That's how you know that they are the producer. If God is the one that made your body, then he has spare parts. I also read a book many years ago. I came in contact with the book where the writer said he was in heaven and he got to a cubicle where body parts where he saw human parts. I, I, here, here. What are all these? And the angel said, It's for the people of God, for the sons of the, of the Father. But they don't ask for it. They are here. If they demand for it, it, it will be taken and given to them to replace the damaged part of their body. My faith increased. I began to pray for people, commanding the damaged part to be taken away and new ones to be brought. And I began to see results. Some of them began to see vision of how strange persons appear, angels, where I minister to them and they are slain in the spirit. They will tell me how an angel came and removed something from their body and placed another one. Replacement. I minister to a lady who had bleeding heart at Uba War Crusade. The heart was bleeding, and the doctor gave her a few days to leave. And as I minister to her, I'm sure by the end of this broadcast, my media coordinator will bring the video of that girl, how she was healed. I minister to her, and she fell under the anointing. And what happened? An angel appeared and removed the heart that was bad. Because he said, the angel asked her, what do you want? Do you want it repaired or you want it replaced? She said, replaced. And the angel removed the old heart and brought a new one and fixed it there. She got up and she began to jump. She began to dance. She began to do what she couldn't do before. All of us were surprised. Up to date, she is still alive because the heart was replaced. What took me to that dimension of courage and confidence in ministry to go? Because I got a revelation of who God is as the maker. And makers can replace any part of their product. 
Oh, I pray for somebody listening to me right now. Any part of your body that has been damaged beyond repair, I declare a replacement in the name of Jesus. A replacement in your eyes. A replacement in your ears. A replacement in your head. A replacement in your body. A replacement in your bones. A replacement of your womb. A replacement of body parts. Whatever part in your body that have been damaged by the devil, by demons, by circumstances, I command a replacement. Oh God, the maker. The maker. Yahweh, the maker. That they may know you are truly what I call you. That you are the maker. Let there be a testimony from this ministration that somebody's part that was damaged was replaced supernaturally in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The God that confirmed the words of his servant. Glory to God. Glory to God. Calling the names of God meditatively is key. It's a factor that validates your worship. That makes your worship acceptable. That makes your worship profitable. Calling the names of God. Meditatively. That's how to honor the name of God. You know, he said in Malachi 2 verse 2. He said, because you have not honored my name. I have cursed you already. In fact, your blessings are cursed. And if they say, I will bring shame upon you and embarrassment. And a power will come and take you out of your establishment. Because you are not honoring my name. Because you are not glorifying my name. You see, there are many problems we have because we are not honoring the name of God. We are not glorifying the name of God. How? By meditating on the name. That will not provoke you to worship him properly. Meditating on the name that will provoke you to worship him properly. It takes pure meditation to worship the name of God properly. In 2 Peter 1 verse 2, he said, Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God. You see, your knowledge of God you know people by their names. Your knowledge of God is what multiplies the grace of God in your life. It's what multiplies peace in your life. You're not, how much you know God? Now look at me. I, I was in the dimension of creativity before. Now when I got to know him in that dimension, the grace of healing multiplied. The grace of healing multiplied. Meditate on the names of God. You have broader revelation from that, that name. And look at Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 3. He said, Thy name is as ointment poured forth. Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 3. Your name is like anointing that is poured out. What does anointing do? Isaiah 10, verse 27. By the reason of the anointing, your yoke, the yoke is broken. It means when you call his name, it's like anointing poured out. He breaks yokes. I dedicate somebody listening to me. For every revelative name you will call from today, for every revelative name you will pronounce, may the anointing of God back up that name to break any yoke in that direction. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Songs of Solomon 1 verse 3. Thy name is as oil. It's as ointment. It's like anointing that is poured forth. <laughs> it means it breaks yokes. When you discover the name of God, remember the book of Matthew 16, 13 to 19. When Jesus sat down and he knows that the problem they have now is that they don't know his name. If they can know his name, <laughs> if they can know his name, there's a realm they will be translocated to. Look at what he said. 
Matthew 16, verse 13 to 19. Jesus came and asked them, What do people call me? What do they call me? Because I now, I now know that they are problem. Why they are not getting the best from me? They don't know me. What do they call me? Then the disciples said, They call you Jeremiah. Some call you Isaiah. Some call you this and that. So, okay, you leave them. You that I have been that have been following me. What do you call me? What do you call me? None of them could answer because they don't know him. But Peter got a revelation. And he said, Your name, you are Christ, the Son of the Living God. Ah, he said, No, this revelation came from the Father. I pray in the name of the Lord. May the Father, the source of all knowledge, impart upon you a revelative discovery of his name in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I, I, I will pray this prayer again. May the Father, I ask, that the Father will give you a revelative understanding of his names in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Of course, you know that's what Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians 1 from verse 16, 17, 18. He said, I pray that God may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. And verse 19, that you may have the fullness of God. You want to have the fullness of God? You must be able to catch a revelation of who God is. Meditate on the names of God. I told you before the end of this conference, I'll be giving you some names of God as we progress. So that you begin to use to add to the vocabulary of your praises. And then, look at what he said. God, he said, let's look at that scripture. He said, I will build my church. What is the church of God? The future. I will build my church and the gate of hell shall not prevail against it. It means your future is built upon the revelation you have about him. Oh, oh glory to God. Your future is built upon how much revelation you were able to capture about who God is. I will build my future, my church, upon this rock. Which rock? Not Peter. Upon the revelation that Peter declared. Of course, no Christ is a rock. Like 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. Said Jesus was the rock that followed them in the wilderness. Christ was the rock that followed them in the wilderness. So he was talking about Christ, that name. Upon the revelation of this name you caught, I will build your future. So your future is the product of how much of God you know. So your future is built upon how much of God you know. If you are not developing your knowledge of God, then your future is going to be small. I will build my church and the gate of hell shall not prevail against it. Any progress that comes via the knowledge of who God is, no power can fight it. Any knowledge of God that comes out of harm or of a revelation of who God is, any progress, any success that you capture, you were able to see in your life that came as a result of the revelation of the God you capture. No power can fight against it. I will build my church, and the gate of hell shall not prevail against it. They said, I will give you the key. Oh, no, key, easy access. It means from one level to the other. You will not struggle to enter another level when you know who God is. They said, authority will be given to you. Now, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth is losing heaven. Outstanding benefits. Of discovery who God is.
Look at what David said. Because David knows the meaning of the name of God. In Psalm 124, he said, Our head is in the name of the Lord. Our head is in the name of the Lord. You want help? Then you despair and be studying the names of God and be meditating on the names of God. Our help. You want help? You say, God help me, God help me. It's like sing this song. My help power come along. You sing this song. No, it's not going to bring God as for God to help you. <laughs> you must know the name of God. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I hope you are catching it. Our head is in the name of the Lord. So if you don't know the names of God, you may not get help in certain areas. The help you need in that area is hidden in the name of God in that area. The help you need for your healing is hidden in the name of God in healing. That is Jehovah Rapha. He is the healer. By his strength you are healed. If you don't know him, you will not get help. That's why in the book of 1st Samuel 17 verse 45 when Goliath was boasting and intimidating Israel, others were, were, were afraid but David knew the name. Look at what he said. Then David said, Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear, a shield, but I come in the name of the Lord of hosts. I come in the name of the Lord of hosts. That's the name he took. The Lord of hosts. Because this was a, a, a warfare time. Battle. And he, he invoked the name of God associated with war. The Lord of hosts. The host of warring angels. Warring angels. Battle ready angels. The Lord. The owner of the angelic hosts that are involved in war. <laughs> he invoked that name. I come in the name of the Lord of hosts. Bah, and the host appeared. Only one stone. It was not the stone. It was the host of angels that knocked, that knocked down Goliath. It was not that stone that killed Goliath. It was the host of angels that David evoked. Calling God the host, the owner, the Lord, the owner of the host of angels. The warring angel, the God that owns the angel that go to battle. I come in that name. Say your head. Is in the name of the Lord. <laughs> I pray the help you need. May you discover the name that will usher in that help. I pray for you in the name of the Lord. May the help you are looking for, may God give you a revelation of his name that will address that help and make that help available. In Proverbs 18 verse 10, he said, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. The name of the Lord, these are Old Testament. So it's not talking about Jesus now, the name of Jesus. He came that one came in the New Testament. He's talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. No, about names of God. These are Old Testament references. In Psalm 50, verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you. Which name are you calling? There was no Jesus in the book of Psalms. He came later. So look for a descriptive name. The name that describes what you are looking for. And put it upon God and honor him and worship him by that name. Boom. It will be around. Psalm 91 verse 14 to 18. Look at what he said. Psalm 91. I will end here. Psalm 91, verse 14 to 16. Because he has known my name. <laughs> because he has known my name. I dedicate you from today. May you go into discoveries of the names of God. May you begin to meditatively understand the names of God. And as you begin to do that, may these benefits rush into your life in the name of Jesus. Psalm 91, verse 14. To 16, because he has known my name, one, I will set him on high. I will set him on high. I will set him on high. 
I will set him on high. I will set him on high. I declare for somebody who's listening to me right now. For every name of God you know. As you begin to study the names of God. And meditatively honor him. May God set you on high. No matter how low the enemy kept you right now. May the power of God bring you out from that level. And lift you on high. In the name of Jesus Christ. I just give you one name just now. The God that make it battle to end. The God that make it war to cease. Let us begin from here. Let me begin to catalog and give you names of God that will add to your vocabulary. The God that make it war to end. And the evil will never reoccur. your call. The God that make it battle to cease. That's the name of God we discover. If you embrace this name of God, I declare the battle that raised you from the beginning of the year comes to an end this month in the name of Jesus Christ. I dedicate to God. If you embrace this name of God, that is the one that make it war to cease. Is the one that make it battles to come to an end. And the evil does not reoccur. I speak into your life. Every battle of poverty, every battle of affliction, every battle of stagnation, every battle of frustration, every battle of barrenness, every battle of not being able to marry, every battle of no visa, no document, every battle of demonic int uh, intimidation that has surrounded your life. Today, Katopara, that battle comes to an end. In the name of Jesus, I command that battle to come to an end. In the name of the God that make it battle to cease, that make it war to end. I come in the name of the Lord who make it war to cease. I come in the name of the Lord who make it battle to end. I confront that battle. I command that battle to, to, to stop. I command that battle to cease. I command that battle to come to an end. I command that battle to cease. In the name of Jesus, I stop the battle of barrenness. In the name of Jesus, I stop the battle of not being able to marry. In the name of Jesus, I stop the battle of poverty. In the name of Jesus, I stop the battle of academic frustration. In the name of Jesus, I stop the battle of disease in your body. In the name of Jesus, I stop the battle of, of, of spiritual weakness. In the name of Jesus, I stop the battle of spirit husband, spirit wife, in the name of Jesus. I stop the battle of miscarriages, in the name of Jesus. I stop the battle of struggling and no result, in the name of Jesus. I stop the battle of rejection, in the name of Jesus. I stop the battle of backsliding sin, in the name of Jesus. I stop the battle of reoccurring evil every year, in the name of Jesus. Let take a para. I stop the battle in the name of the God that puts an end to battles. I stop these battles in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I feel like ending here, but let me just rush through this reference I quoted. Then I will set him on high. He shall call upon me and I will answer. Because you have known my name. You will call upon me, God say he will answer. He says, as I call upon him, just on the God that make a battle to cease. He will answer me because that is his name. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him. I will honor him. I will satisfy him with long life. And I will show him my salvation. What a beautiful reference. That is Psalm 91, verse 14 to 16. I dedicate to God. That battle comes to an end. The name of God we've taken today is that the battle comes, the God that make it battle to cease. Memorize it. Use it today throughout the day to worship God. And then you'll be meditating, you'll be meditating on scripture stories where 
battles came to an end. Where battles came to an end. Be looking for stories in the Bible where God ended the battle. The first reference was Psalm 46, verse 9. Psalm 46, verse 9. He maketh wars to cease. He maketh war to cease. He breaketh the bow, cut the spear asunder, and burned the chariots in fire. This it destroys the instrument of war of your enemies. I declare in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every war that the enemy have suddenly raised in your life. They come to an end today in the name of Jesus. I come against the battle you are passing through in the name of the God that make it war to cease. That that war come to an end in the name of Jesus Christ. And all the instruments that they are using. I come in the name of the God who break the bow. Who destroy and cut the spear asunder. In the name of the God that burned the chariots in fire. That all the instrument the enemy is using against you, they will be destroyed this season. They will be destroyed this season in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm in Nahum 1 verse 9. Say, so what do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an altar end. I declare in the name of Jesus that whatever you are passing through, it comes to an end, total end. Total end. And said affliction shall not rise up the second time. I declare every evil you suffered before. They are ending today. They will not reoccur again. In the name of Jesus Christ. I declare in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever evil event. Evil circumstance. That you have experienced before. They end today. And they will never reoccur again. In the name of Jesus Christ. I declare every evil you experienced before since the beginning of the year or some few weeks ago, some few days ago. I declare that the end today in the name of the Lord God that brings an end to issues, that brings an end to battle. That makes an altar end. I come in the name of the Lord God. That makes an altar end. I declare that evil comes to an altar end. That evil comes to an altar end. In the name of Jesus. And I declare that evil will never come back again. We never come back again. We never come back again. In Jesus mighty name. The God that will not deny himself. The God that says, I will not deny myself. Thank you, Father, for not denying yourself. In the life of my viewers, I shall bring their battles to an end. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you for being a part of this program. This is day four of the 2023 prayer and worship conference. Therefore, it's time to take our offerings, sowing the seed to activate the declarations that were declared during the conference into your life. Sowing seed, whenever there's a conference and there's a registration fee attached to the conference, you don't need an offering. The registration you have paid for everything. Offering is a choice. But when there is no registration fee attached to a conference of necessity, you must, at the end of every day's lecture, give an offering. So the details are on the screen. I'm sure the media director will upload it again and let it flow and let, it, let them see it. Those in Europe those in uh, outside the country, we have a Mozo Bank. The account is there. The I Bank is there. The Sort Code is there. Uh, and then for those in Nigeria, the Naira Zenit account is there. I dedicate you to God as you drop your seed. The Bible says, "Seed time and harvest time shall never cease." As I see your seed appearing as an alert. I declare you will see your harvest, your harvest of expectation. 
what you are believing God for in this conference. As I see your seed, you will see your expected harvest. In the name of Jesus, I'll say the prayer again three more times. As I see your seed as an alert in the, in the alert, you will see your harvest. In the name of Jesus, as I see your seed, you will see your harvest. In the name of Jesus, that was a seed time and harvest time shall never cease. That's your light which shall not be put off. You will shine from glory to glory. I want to close up the broadcast. Make sure you sow your seed. It will bless you abundantly. And secondly, prophetic seed means that you are evoking the anointing to manifest that every declaration that was declared will manifest like that. They will come to pass. And I declare as your seed is represented today, every declaration I declared in this broadcast will be manifested in your life. In the name of Jesus Christ, he that giveth to a prophet shall get a prophet's reward. The reward of a prophet is that his word comes to pass. In the name of Jesus. I love you so much. I declare that before the end of the 40 days, you have a testimony to render. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Please don't forget to share the broadcast. It's very important. Bye-bye.